The Racing Pod. On Off The Ball. With William Hill. Best odds guaranteed on all Irish and UK racing. 18 plus. See gamblingcare.ie. And you're welcome to episode 13 of The Racing Pod and Off The Ball with John Duggan and Johnny Ward. Remember, we're here every Friday with analysis, race previews, tips, stories, crack, interviews. The first half of the pod each week is free to air. The second part is exclusively for members. So be sure to sign up by going to offtheball.com forward slash join. For members this week, we will preview Saturday's action at Nace and Newbury. So subscribe now for all the juicy info. Johnny, how are you getting on? Good, JD. I see over 20,000 people at the Dublin Racing Festival on the Sunday. The Saturday, I think. The Saturday. Yeah, and the Sunday was a bit quieter. So I was away, but um, this is a staggering success story. I mean, it, apparently around a third of the crowd were British. Um, so they came over. For, I think there was a good package. Now, the, the flip side is, anecdotally, it, it did seem to be stretched to breaking point. Um, I think when Galileo took on Fantastic Lies, I don't know you were racing that day. 2001, it wasn't. That was no. the one. Apparently, that was like, it goes to 20,000. Very rare you get those crowds nowadays, but they've marketed this very well. And the influx of British race scores, which, which is it's kind of turning Cheltenham on its head a bit. Yes. Massive success story. They probably do need to work a little bit with... Um, See, punch tends to lost the space. Yeah. It's it's actually there's a massive difference in Leverstone Punch Town. When you go there, you realise it. So maybe Tim Husbands and his team will take um, learnings from this going forward. But these are good problems to have. Like race courses have major major issues trying to attract crowds day to day. Festivals are doing well, but there are, you know the King George had a really really decimated crowd this year in Britain. So it's not that um, everything is rosy over there. And Leopardstown and everyone deserve massive credit for this because they've really worked on the British race score and he or she enjoys coming over here for top class racing. What we'll do is actually at the start, Johnny, we'll look at the Dublin Racing Festival and maybe see what the clues are for the Chatham Festival, which is coming up in next month now, just over a month's time. So William Mullins' domination, that's the first thing. And look, it's not his fault, right? Eight grade ones, eight grade one winners. Um, when I went to Cheltenham in 2002 for the first time, I was really intimidated as an Irish journalist going over there just by the magnitude and the scale of the size of what this is, what this meant when I was a young person going. And it took me five years to get into the press room. And in 2004, there were four Irish winners at Cheltenham out of 20 races. That's 20%. Ooh, who were they? Uh, well, Brave Inca was one total enjoyment off the top of my head. I that well. Uh, then in 20, it was going 2014, 44% of the winners. We don't need four winners in... In 2004. Wow. Uh, that was and, my second and the, Cheltenham. Yeah. Last year, 64% of the winners. In this year, you got 65% of the entries for the Grand National Irish trained. So, of course, if William Mullins is the best trainer here, and Ireland is so dominant in horse racing, both here and in the UK, it's not a surprise he's had grade one winners in a way. We should be... People are kind of almost shocked. It's not a shock. It's not a shock, no, and Paul Townend wasn't on the right one a lot of the time, which wasn't a shock either because he was on um, he was on novices. He, you know, I'd say he had some tough calls to make. Danny which is really Mullen... good for the integrity of the game oh, as totally. well. Totally, Danny Mullins wins on Dancing City was like sixteen to one. Tipped on the the live road show, tipped Dancing City twenty to one. So there you go. Like was probably the outsider of the Mullins horse in that field, given everything. Danny has a treble uh, of Grade Ones like. An unbelievable day. None of them favourite. None of them the first string for Willie. Um, so it wasn't that... Like, Willie has, has has really embraced this festival, you know, and I think he had a... Uh, I'm paraphrasing maybe a bit, but I think he had a little bit of a dig at Nicky Henderson for not running Constitution Hill. He was like... He was extolling the programme that Galvin Deschamps and Stateman have enjoyed and just saying, these horses are happy to run. They're going to come there fitting well. And maybe there was a little bit of... Um, you know, a bit of mis uh, mystique in his eyes or having having a bit of a crack about, you know, the Constitution Hill wasn't here. But the point is, Willie Mullins was happy to say, say if you have a powerful owner, and he says, listen, I want to... Um, and you have a lot of egos involved in the game with big owners, obviously, and he or she says, Willie, you know, I think this race will really suit this horse, and Willie might be apt to say it will, but I probably have something better in it. That's just how it is. So you might be um, on the second string in my yard, but they'll be running on their merits. And if Willie had taken... Um, the approach that he wouldn't run that many horses in the big races because he wanted to um, ensure that they were kept apart so they, that they wouldn't suffer defeats, it would have been a pretty bad Dublin Racing Festival. Well, the Dublin Racing Festival is a new concept. It's only coming in the last couple of years. And this time of year was about two races, about the Gold Cup and the Champion Hurdle. That mm. was really all this meeting was about in February at Leopardstown. Um, I'm just wondering, though, should he have left Galopin des Chances at home? Because Galopin des Chances won at Christmas by 23 lengths was more workmanlike this time. The ground uh, was pretty poor last week to, to be riding on. So I think he did well in the circumstances. I just wonder what it would take 
the edge off him a bit going to Cheltenham. He has disappointed twice in his career. I know they they saw that as an end point in itself last week. The, there's an Irish Gold Cup. But if you're looking to win the Cheltenham Gold Cup, was it the right thing to do, I wonder? I think that's an extraordinary view to take and some people do take it like Mouse Morris didn't run Gentleman's Game because... Well, I, find, like, I mean, you said about Gentleman's Game and I think you're absolutely right. Gentleman's Game is the freshest... It'd be fresh as pain to go to the Cheltenham Gold Cup. Fresh He... You see, Mouse would say he's had he's had growing pains. Now the horse, rather than Mouse, right? So the horse is big, <laughs> and he's he's afraid to to risk him. And I think with Willie, you know, he is a creature of habit. I think he thinks Galvin Deschamps is able to take his race, and and I completely agree with what he said. If he doesn't win the Gold Cup, he was taking on three runners in the big, pretty much the big race of the two days at a Dublin race festival that is now more attractive to a lot of British race scores than Cheltenham itself. I genuinely believe that. They came over here to see top-class horses and he won the race. It was a brilliant race to watch, I thought. As much as Paul Townend was able to kind of go his own um, funereal pace at times, watching JJ Slevin try to figure out how what's the best way of me winning this and also not necessarily finish fourth and second if I go after him too early. On ground, that was very testing. It was a brilliant race to watch. Um, and he's won, the, he's won that. He was brilliant again. He's won two grade one back-to-back in Ireland. And if he doesn't win the Gold Cup, like he might, he might be injured come come the Gold Cup anyway. You got to take these races as they come. Do you think they're on. the best two horses in the Gold Cup picture? Gallop on the chance of faster slow. Um, they could well be, but I, I do think Gentleman's Game is, is one of those horses that will come there and will will be will be very well. Like faster or slow, I I. It's hard to see him reverse the form. That's the problem. If you want to, maybe they are the best two in the race, but like, can you really see faster or slow reversing the form come Cheltenham? Un- unless something happened to the favourite, I don't really see it. Because um, I, I I think the excuses that were offered after his two defeats now become very valid. I thought Fast Slower in a very, very good race, so did nothing wrong. So we mentioned Dancing City there, who I still think is underrated, Dancing City, because he was second behind Ballyburn at Punchestown last season. We see that form has been franked. He also won his point. So I think this horse is still under the radar in terms of a stay in race to Cheltenham, potentially. Although I still think the best race I've seen in the last few months in terms of a stay in hurdle or mid- mid-hurdle in terms of distance is the one that reading Tommy Wrong won. Mm. Um, I think it was at Nace. Nace, that's the big race. That Nace, was rescheduled, yeah. yeah. And he beat uh, Elan uh, Il- Atlantique. But in the juvenile race, so Storm Harsh was hugely impressive at Punchestown. Maybe the ground once again took the edge off his turn of foot against Cargis. Yeah, I, I actually backed um, I backed Paul Townend's mount in this because I just thought it, that's the one. Yeah, the prices he was he was getting like he went, went out to sort of he was maybe five four the day before and coming to the off he was nearly three to one, and um, I I sort of backed him each way thinking you know he'd be thereabouts but he didn't really have any excuse. I think maybe maybe the ground to an extent but taking on good juveniles here this was a really interesting race because I think Willie had um, did he have five of the first six home. Um, I'm just looking here. So, Cargese, Stormheart, Marsborough, first time out for the yard. Yeah. Really eye catching. Ethical Diamond, though, was the horse that I put up. That finished um, six, was only beaten five lengths. Very eye catching. Now, if that horse were to um, get a mark before the Fred Winter, uh, I'd be very, very interested in it. I don't think the ground was ideal for him at all. Went off 50 to one. There wasn't a bean for it. Um, really interesting runner. And Calaconte was just ahead of him. So, I, I thought. I thought that race was fascinating in, in its own right, but also as a trial for both the, the four-year-old races at Cheltenham. And again, you've Willie running all these horses who were basically on, on their merits and trying. And uh, I, I wouldn't be ruled out Stormheart at Cheltenham for all that Sergino looks. Well, there was, and the horse that Sergino actually beat in France, yes. whose name escapes me, is now with Willie Mullins for the Donnellys. Um, so I'll find that for the end of the show, but there's a connection there as well. That horse hasn't been seen in Ireland yet. So. Well, the Chinese government came to Dublin and it was kind of really low-key a few weeks ago and they had this plane, the biggest Nothing ever. Nothing low-key about the plane. Uh, the plane, I saw the plane on a social media take off and it just like, this is some fascinating 30 seconds of footage and beautiful weather at Dublin Airport, this Chinese plane taken off and like a bit of afternoon and then I tracked it. I tracked it over Moscow and I tracked it over the Ural Mountains and everything and see where it was five hours later on his way back to Beijing with the, the, the Chinese Premier. But that's why I kind of felt like Sergino was going to do that. He was actually going to take off uh, when he passed the winning line at Cheltenham in that juvenile race. I haven't seen a horse win like that in quite a while. Probably, probably Constitution Hill, obviously, but he kind of almost raced in a different way. But this horse was something else. Very hard to see him being beaten at Cheltenham. Yeah, and he beat, it was it was um, Salvador, Salvatore Mundi, who he beat at Otoy in April. Um, and I'm always I'm always intrigued when the when a, an owner snaps up a horse um that beat his or, or finished second to but like the the Donnellys obviously like both the horses because they, they have the two of them now and Sergino looks a monster I really like Bird of Road I do wonder did Bird of Road run his race he was all out to finish second he looked very tired 
but Sergino was monstrous. And the Caldwell Potter move to um, Alex Ferguson and to Alex, Alex Ferguson and, and also to Paul Nichols all of a sudden. Like he beat Predator's goal. He looks he looks a really good horse, brother to Mighty Potter. Cost three quarters of a million during the week. But now you have the two heavyweights in in or the two traditional heavyweights in Britain. And Nicky obviously, who's still talking up Shishkin in the Gold Cup. Nicky has Trigino and obviously Constitution Hill and a couple of others. And now Nicholas is a very, very good novice himself. So the champion chase picture, El Fabiola won effortlessly at Leopardstown. We had Sean Flanagan at the Le- Racing Pod uh, Live Roadshow, our first one there at the Mason Hotel just over a week ago. And he was kind of speaking about, I asked him about, well, El, El Fabiolo tends to maybe not jump that fluently at times. And is this a worry for him maybe being on the deck at one stage? And he said he'd almost rather have a horse that mm. um, ha- is quirky, makes a few mistakes, but doesn't fall as opposed to one that falls out of the blue. Like John Bond's mistake there in his last run, knocked the stuffing out of him and he was very lucky to not part company with James Bowen. So I kind of get what you were saying, but it's, it's just hard to... to, to, to you, you'd be a pretty confident person to be back in the Al Fabiola odds on at Cheltenham. Yeah, I suppose it depends on how your day is going away because <laughs> Cheltenham can get the best of you, you know. I remember Big Bucks was the horse that, like, if you were sort of in Stuck, like, he'd do the job. Um, El Fabiola is probably a bit more of a bit of a roller coaster ride, but I don't really think he looks like falling any time. And uh, he and Paul Townend now have developed this relationship where... Um, I don't think there's going to be a problem with him. And having said that, I expect John Bond to give him a bit of a do you, race. Do you rate uh, Fabiolo superior to John Bond? Yeah, like you'd ha- you'd have to because yeah. he be no. Nicky Henderson would say that John Bond wasn't at his best last March, but um, I was disappointed in the last day to be honest. Well, that state man, the vibes from the Mullins Yard are very very bullish about this horse, and he's been visually, I think, more impressive this season. He's won all three of his races. He should be closer to Constitution Hill. But will he be close enough? I wonder. I think Paul Townend was of the opinion that he wasn't quite at his best in, in March um, and it's the only evidence we've ever seen of him being vulnerable to anything. Like this is, uh, so many things in, in life are relative, JD. You know, I, I always find like when everyone was poor in Ireland, nobody was poor if that made sense. But when you bring inequality into the mix and like there's massive chasm between the wealthy and the poor, that's when problems begin. And if we didn't have Constitution Hill, we just think this horse statement was the best ever. Like we think he, this is as good a two miler as we've seen. He's he's hammering everything, but then he runs up against Constitution Hill and he's beaten like twelve lengths. So it's kind of like, was that actually his true running? And if Constitution Hill is that good, he must be the best jumper I've ever seen because Stateman is exceptional. He's he's the most reliable horse. The most I'd say Paul Townend of every horse he's ever ridden. This is the most straightforward. He just does everything you'd want him to, except he once ran into Constitution Hill, who should have been at the Dublin Racing Festival. And Willie is kind of probably, he's enjoying it. But the two-mile division, let's be honest, has been very boring because he's comfortably superior to everything else. And having said that, Imperia Passi, who was ridden forward on this occasion, yeah. as was suggested on our road show, it's like, well, he has to ride him differently. The first kind of, I think it was the first audience uh, comment was like they have to write him differently they did write him differently and he ended up probably costing him second place because Stateman is very very good I think he's disappointed this season in Perry Pass I have to say the mm. freshman up for entry um, Marine National Gaelic Warrior so Marine National Barry Connells put it on the ground and Gaelic Warrior just surely can't go over fences left handed do you see it that way? Uh, I, I'd, I'd struggle to see him going to Cheltenham Um this, you know, the Gaelic Warrior Fact File race was the black mark of the festival, really. It was just a bit of a goo-boo situation where all of these things combined to make it a mess. And then you had Gaelic Warrior, who I would say in a, in a, on another day, Paul Townend might have even pulled him up. He was just like, well, you know, I'm fighting for considerable prize money to finish second here. I'll keep going. But he jumped the last so badly for a horse that all he had to do was pop it. So he was restless beforehand. I, I think there was more to it than just going left-handed. I think it was a complete off day for him. Yeah. Back to file, I spoke to Mark Walsh during the week. I, I do think they really like this horse. Like, But is he better than Grange Clare West? Well, that I, was, don't th- I don't think he is. But Corbett's Cross was in the race as well. So Yeah, I don't think Corbett's Cross is natural. Maybe not. Now, they brought him, obviously, to Ferry House on Wednesday in a four-runner race, and he ended up colliding with another horse and being brought down. But if he had come here, which to me would have been the logical place to go, but like J.P. McManus would probably forego running in a group, a grade one at Leopardstown to have a Cheltenham winner, even though it's a bit of an egg and spoon race, the four miler, the three mile six or as it is now. So went to, went to obviously a lesser race. Grange Clare West, on the other hand, he just, I think he was cast in his box, so he couldn't run, but he, it, we, don't, we just don't know where Factor yeah. Pile is. But they do like him because they would have run him over hurdles otherwise. Mm. That they're going the Florida Pearl route does say that they do mm. like him a lot and we'll see what happens. As for Marine Nationale, that was my, I, I think it's the first time I've ever backed him. I, I thought he was 
practically gone by because, I, you know, I, I opposed him at Christmas. This is really frustrating in racing. I, I laid him at Christmas because I thought he wouldn't handle the ground. He then bolted up at Christmas, but now Barry Connell is saying that the ground at the Drum Race Festival was quite different to Christmas. There could well be something to that. Now, there would be an, a, an expression of doubt as well about how... how kind of physically sound he is because he found nothing and he did have he did wear it he's wear, worn a tongue tie this season yeah so disappointing you know JD just for a horse that's um, I, I'm not giving up on him at all at Cheltenham I'm still in the Marine National camp on okay. better ground Presu- presuming we get better ground yeah but that was a disappointment in the festival. so other Cheltenham clues I mean I would say to folks don't read too much into because of the ground mm. I think on spring ground at Cheltenham if it is that way in March it does get kind of windy in that bowl at Cheltenham on the assumption um, uh, that'll be the case you can forgive a lot of horses. I remember a couple of years ago, Willie Mullins had a load of winners at Dublin Race Festival, but none of his Cheltenham winners actually ran at the Dublin Race Festival. Mm. Uh, it wasn't the case it's last funny year. you mentioned the two horses at Nace. Like, there are two other novices we didn't even see yet. Well, like, reading so. Tommy Wrong and Neil Atlantic, you got to follow those horses, yeah. folks. Uh, Yates Star ran well in the three-mile handicap hurdle. Uh, probably another win in the Mayor Brucio I took out of uh, Dublin Race Festival. Hope Ali Byrne was good. Uh, Dino Blue is so admirable. What a lovely mare. Uh, Bob Ollinger, I think, should go to Aintree. And Percival Lagalwa, who Gavin Cromwell trains, was at our road show, uh, fell in the handicap chase when he was challenging at the last. He's well treated over fences if he can jump better. Percival Lagalwa. Yeah, and he, he was very sweet. I thought the road show, the lads were brilliant. Thanks to everyone who came. And Gavin was very sweet on um, Pat Doru in the big handicap, who just ran into one. Maybe yeah. didn't quite jump well enough, but if you backed him each way, you got a great run for your money. Um, and Percival Lagalwa. I think his best days have yet to be written. The first roadshow was a great success, as Johnny said, at the Mason Hotel in Dublin. And there's a lot more to come, so stay tuned for more details. So Nav and Sunday, we're going to look at two races in the free-to-air section. Uh, the Boyne Hurdle at 2.45, the Grade 2 on Sunday. Uh, I like to capo glory in this, Johnny. Uh, comes into the race as a winner at Cork earlier in the month. Has a good attitude. He ran well at Punchestown last year at the festival. I think he's got an each way chance. Yeah, it's a it's a very very difficult race. Some real familiar names. Sorry to Burley, obviously. I presume going back to try try it again. The stairs hurdle. Um, Blazing Cal, who looking at the betting here has been put in a short favourite. That's risky enough uh, in the sense that this won the horse, race last year. Won the race last year, but has only run once twice since twenty twenty one. And obviously. Um, I was five to one last year, presuming, and then obviously went to Cheltenham. Didn't run too badly at Cheltenham, all told, but questions to answer. Tell to work in Galvin, obviously, we'll have other plans uh, ahead as well, and we'll we'll see how those horses rock up in the next few months. But the Capo Glory, good horse. I wouldn't rule out Hidden Valley Lake as well. Yeah, Shalikov, the sire of hard one to pin down. He's only yeah. had five runs, uh, flopped over fences. Rachel uh, is suspended, I think, at the moment. Okay. So Darrow keeps picking up some nice rides at the weekend, and uh, I'd maybe go with Hidden Valley Lake. To, I, to, I think it's a tricky race, and. Um, a great renewal of it as well. At a you know the the Boyne hurdle is a, is as much a prep for sort of other races as well. But two mile five uh, around Navan on this ground is going to be really really intriguing for the jockeys. Like the the ground at Ferry House JD was as bad as I've seen pretty much ever on on Wednesday. Okay, we also have Ashdale Bob in the race and Beacon Edge will be ridden by Jack Kennedy. This is Navan Sunday heavy ground and that hill to climb and the ten up novice chase three forty five a great two. Um, it's interesting that Paul Tannen rides Nick Rocket over Manella Kakuna in this one. Yeah, that that wouldn't have been straightforward because Nick Rocket he was he was only um sent off two to seven um the last day, which was his second chase start. Now he'd run in that really hot race behind Corvus Cross, but the horse that he beat tactical move landed a gamble then um at Gorn um and he's not a bad type at all and he beat him by seven lengths. I suppose on that basis the three miles on heavy should be fine. I I'd maybe. Nella Kakuna or Danny Ryden. Danny could win on the stable yak at the moment. I'd maybe <laughs> maybe slightly prefer him. I I I just at the prices. Um but it would be a close one. It wouldn't be ruling out um Favre de Champ do. American Mike for me, I just thought he was very disappointed at Limerick. Well Favre de Champ do is a mudlark, but I'm just a bit worried about him going left handed mm. because um he jumped right handed at Leperstown. He's pulled up at Chatham going left handed, the grand suit. So I think he's got questions to answer. So does American Mike because uh, a bit like his hurdling career, and he hasn't trained on in his chasing career because he was like he beat Fact to File first time out. I think Fact to File probably needed the run. But like and then beating twenty five lengths at Limerick. Yeah. Well, it, I, that race has been a bit of a graveyard for everybody. Um possibly ground related. But if it were if it were ground related, he's not going to get any better here. He, he let Tetons aside. But I, I can't have American Mike. I can't have Senesia. I'm gonna go for Melanica Kakuner because I think it's a course and distance winner sets the standard. Um I think he probably needed the run at Leopardstown. He jumps well. His novice hurdling career was at a very high level. I'm gonna go for Melanica Kakuner like yourself. So make mine a double J, Johnny 
Uh, two forty-five Nav on Sunday. De Capo Glory each way at nine to one. Do you have one for the? I'll go with Union Station for Chris Jones and Gavin Cromwell. Two thirteen ace tomorrow. Okay, what price around that? Um, at a at a guess seven to four maybe. Okay, yeah. Union Station and De Capo Glory for the Mega Man a Double J on the Racing Pod uh, this week. This is the Racing Pod on Off the Ball. If you're listening to the free version of the podcast, we'll be leaving you here. But if you're looking for more, including our analysis of the Saturday cards at Nace and Newbury, go to offtheball.com forward slash join to subscribe and get the full podcast every Friday with our racing tips, insights and stories from the week's action.